Hello, Lions Led by Donkeys listeners. Normally, Joe does the Patreon plug, but it's me, Nate, and I'm here with a special announcement. This is the first installment of the four-part Red Army Faction series hosted by Tom and Joe, but the other three episodes are already available on the Patreon at the $5 tier. They'll all eventually come out on the free feed, but if you want to hear the entire series now, check the link in the show notes or go to patreon.com slash lionsledbydonkeys to sign up. Thanks. And please enjoy this episode. Hallo Leute, willkommen zum Lions Led by Donkeys Podcast. Ich bin Tom und hier bei mir, bei, bei mir ist Joe. Hallo Joe. I hate this so much. <laughs> <laughs> so if you are uh, li- kind of shocked, this is a, not a Joe series. Um, if you can definitely read the title. We are doing a series on the Red Army Faction. For some reason, the Irishman has to do all the series on terrorism. <laughs> hey, we all have our strengths. <laughs> How are you doing, Joe? I uh, I am currently melting. Um, it is getting close to August. Well, it will be August by the time this episode comes out here in Armenia, which means it is getting close to 100 degrees. Um, and I am dying. Uh, on top of that, I finally went and got my hair cut yesterday uh and previously i've had the same barber for over a year now since i've lived here right mm. but things in armenia have a tendency like business fronts uh have a tendency to vanish overnight from time to time like mm. they'll just get closed down and the 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 storefront will just be an empty shell yeah and you'll have no idea what happened right <laughs> um and that happened with my barber so over the last like several weeks i've been trying desperately to find another one and you never do anything here without a recommendation Like, there's Mm. barbers everywhere. Don't walk into the one and get a haircut. This goes for anything. Um, We are are what is known as a low-trust society, Mm -hmm. where everything works on recommendations and and stuff like that. So I have been trying to do this for a very long time, and finally my hair was just getting so out of control, because when my hair grows, it grows straight up into like an Afro-like mess of curls. Yeah, you are you are Armenian. Yeah. Um. So it finally got to the point that I was like, I can't take it anymore. I have to go get a haircut. So I found a place which I will not name. Um. That was just terrible. Uh, my Armenian is not great when it comes to describing certain things. So like a uh, a baseline understanding of like being able to speak a mix between Armenian and English to get my point across is kind of important to me when it comes to stuff like this. And I found a place that uh, that does that. Um. Like the the person at the front desk spoke English. I was like, oh, perfect. You know, her English is about as good as my Armenian. So we were able to talk. Um, and uh, so I get there. This haircut takes two hours. Now, most uh, most people don't know how to, what I look like. That's fine. I keep my hair very short. This is a combination of having incredibly thick hair and being in the military for so long. I can't do long hair, right? This somehow, uh, a simple fade haircut takes two hours. And then... Because he does the entire thing with scissors. What? Yeah, I've never seen that before in my life. I've gotten haircuts in a lot of countries. I have never once seen someone get a full fade using a comb and scissors. So it take it takes two hours, and he fucking butchers it. So insane. My fade looks more akin to like a Peaky Blinders high and tight, and I am fucking unhappy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kelly uh, Murphy is now an Oppenheimer and you're now playing P- uh, Thomas Shelby from Peaky Blinders. Like it was so bad that like, you know, me and the, the the woman at the front desk were explaining to the barber because obviously my Armenian is not great. Her English wasn't great. So I resorted to showing pictures and stuff like th- th- it just happens. That's how things work. And, uh, you know, I come up and she's like, oh, that is not what you asked for. I was like, no, it is not. <laughs> And then it cost like 8,000 dram more than I'm used to paying for a haircut. It, it was like the Armenian version of that like lad's barber shop where you can get like a whiskey at the same time. Oh, God. And so, yeah, it, look, I should have known better. And it was made worse because the barber himself had the most fucked up haircut I've ever seen. Yeah. Never trust a barber with a bad haircut. Yeah. It's like, uh, I don't know, like going to a mechanic who doesn't have a car. Yeah. And like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like. So anyone who has gotten their hair cut in London or lives in London know that there is just millions of barber shops everywhere. Same like, here. It's so weird. It's uh, well, like a lot of people say, like, oh, it's easy to do like a money front thing, but it's also like it's a decent business if you can get like the customers. So it's like if you can get people to, you know, you think about it, the average guy is getting his hair cut maybe once a month. Yeah, give or take. 
if you have like a solid base of like a couple of hundred customers, like you're making decent money. And like there is like such a massive range in the UK of like you can pay anything from about like eight pounds for a haircut, which I can do in my area versus like the guy across the street from the studio. It's like 25 quid, That's but he'll insane. do my he'll do a haircut. He'll do my beard. He'll like get the thing the like wand out that's on fire and burn the hair off my ears. I can do that for you in my kitchen. (laughs) I don't trust you with a Bic lighter in my ears, to be honest. But then he'll like, he like washes your hair, give you like a head massage, give you like a hot towel and everything. It's a whole, like I shave my head and I like go at like once a month to this guy in between. I just like shave my head with like a clippers every week. But like this guy gives the full works and like, I have a shaved head, it'll still take like maybe half an hour, 45 minutes because of all the other bits. And it's like, you you know, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. You get you pay cheap for a cheap haircut, you're going to look like you got a cheap haircut. Yeah, I agree. And like, I would be fine paying, you know, whatever the equivalent pay here is for that, for that experience and talent and skill. And like, you know, most Armenian men these days have beards. It's actually kind of, of a new thing from what I've been told. I also have a beard. And like, so I, I need to get my beard trimmed because my beard, much like my, the head of my, uh, my hair, my head is very thick. So he, you know, part of this two hours is also getting my beard trimmed. Not only did he absolutely butcher me with a fucking straight razor, um, but like he fucked up to the point that I had to fix it when I got home. Uh, like, <laughs> I, in short, I look ridiculous and I am unhappy. It's hot. <laughs> it makes things worse, you know? And uh, speaking of bad haircuts, we are talking about the Red Army faction, well, famous for their bad haircuts. I believe those dudes had some fucked up looking drip. Like, <laughs> with, I don't. I, I should start this by saying I don't know pretty much anything about the the Red Army faction, other than they've kind of become ancillary characters in some episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, that is about all I know. Other yeah. than that, like, but when you explain to me like weird German terrorist group from the what? 60s to 80s i'm mm. assuming we're talking 100 percent bowl cuts across the board bowl cuts home cuts with scissors and um, which we'll get to in a subsequent episode lots of hair dye when you're on the run you know you got to change your trim quite a lot but when you think about um left-wing violence in the like 20th century to early 21st century you're really talking about people like etta you're talking about the plo you're talking about the Red Army Faction, also commonly referred to as the Bader Meinhof Group. My boys um, Asala, which we've talked yeah. about. <laughs> so, like, I, 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 I should take that back. They're not my boys. They're, they are, in fact, <laughs> not my boys. If, if you're listening, uh, NSS, you know. So, yeah, in the kind of, particularly after the 60s, you had, like, a lot of these kind of revolutionary groups coming out in reaction to some things that we're going to talk about in a second. But really, when you talk about the like kind of not necessarily paramilitary but ter- left wing terrorist organizations, the Red Army faction, for, or which I will refer to going forward as the RAF, not to be confused with the British Air Force, are are <laughs> the ones terrorists. <laughs> are the ones that immediately come to mind. So uh, we can talk about the history of the Red Army faction without first taking a step back in time and talking about everyone's favorite topic. Do you want to have a guess, Joe? Uh, Nazis. Yeah, we're going to talk about World War II, so not to retread some well-trodden ground, we've covered a lot of topics contained within World War II pretty extensively in this show, but to fully understand the factors that led to the formation of the Red Army faction and the inspiration of its politics, we need to talk about the end of the war, and most importantly, the period directly preceding its end and its direct aftermath, because it's kind of hard to talk about post-war Germany without it. Oh boy, we're talking about denazification, aren't we? Yeah, oh, buddy. Yeah. A process um, that went swimmingly without any Nazis getting into power in East or West Germany. <laughs> so within the waning months of the war, on all fronts, it became more clear that the Nazis were about to get their asses handed to them, and soon there would have to be some sort of plan of what to do with all the territories held by them. Now, this is not to say that discussions about what would have, what would be done had not been had before this. Most of it occurred behind closed doors. The Soviets, for example, had already made speculative plans of what to do if the Nazis had been defeated as early as 1943. 
This included the absorption of the Eastern Front into a greater Soviet Union and the Allies of the East respectively anticipating the reformation and readministration of Western Europe in the model of quote-unquote Western democracy. But it was in February 1945 when the heads of the Soviet Union, United Kingdom and the United States all first met to come to a consensus on what was to be done after the war. This came after the previous Moscow conference in October of the previous year where Churchill and Stalin met to discuss the post-war division of Europe where their claims lay on the soon to be emerging spheres of influence on the continent. The Crimea conference also called the Yalta Conference, was held in Yalta between the 4th and 11th of February after the Germans had been successfully pushed back from Poland, Bulgaria and Romania. There was little doubt in anyone's mind as to what was about to happen in the coming months. Most notably, Charles de Gaulle was excluded from this conference because his beef with because of his beef with Roosevelt and was subsequently excluded from the, Podsta- the Potsdam Conference. <laughs> Good, so- fuck him, that's why. <laughs> you lanky bitch. Yeah. Um, During the meeting, they agreed on some key points, and the ones most relevant to our story are the unconditional surrender of Nazi Germany, the division of Germany into four separate administrative zones, split between Britain, the US, Soviets, and France. Britain taking the West, West, Soviets taking the East, the US taking the South, and France taking the wedge in between the Western Allies. Secondly, and I think most important to our story here today, was the agreement for the comprehensive and thorough denazification and demilitarization of the German state. So, a second conference was held from July 17 to August 2nd, 1945, in Potsdam, Germany. Funnily enough, I saw Opp- Oppenheimer last week, and uh, Potsdam Conference plays a, a pretty big plot point in the development of the Trinity Test. Who would have thought, you know? Don't don't ruin it for me. I don't know how Oppenheimer ends. <laughs> I did not expect that Robert Oppenheimer was slinging so much pipe as he is in the movie. I mean, look, he 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 likes to pretend to be like a tortured artist type. Those are always the ones that do that. <laughs> oh, what have I done? My art has destroyed the world. I have become death the uh, slinger of penis. Um so this was nine weeks after the surrender of the Nazis and marked the official defeat of Nazi Germany. Roosevelt had died in April, R.I.P. Bitch. Uh, so his successor, hey, whoa, whoa. Ha- of all the people that are uh, taking part in this uh, this conference, he is the least worst. <laughs> yeah, but still. Uh, so his successor, Harry Truman, represented the United States. Churchill returned to present to represent Great Britain, but his government had was defeated midway through the conference, and the newly elected Prime Minister Clement Attlee took over. Stalin. Everyone's favorite Stalin returned as well. Um, but Stalin's action in Poland after the Crimea conference and other parts of Eastern Germany had become known at the time. And it was the opinion of a lot of the other parties that he was not to be trusted to uphold his end of the bargain as agreed in the Crimea conference. Oh, man. You're telling me Stalin is an untrustworthy partner in things? <laughs> anyway, oh, let's look at my ongoing politics of Armenia and see how that pans out for all of us. Oh, don't worry, it's going to... uh, Stalin's actions are going to come up again. Um, In light of this, the new representatives from the United States and Great Britain were much more careful with their negotiations. Truman, in particular, believed Roosevelt had been too trusting of Stalin and became extremely suspicious of Soviet actions and Stalin's true intentions. So, the final agreements at at Potsdam concerned the decentralization, demilitarization, and denazification and democratization of Germany... The division of Germany and Berlin and Austrian Vienna into occupation zones, as outlined in Crimea, the prosecution of Nazi war criminals, the return of all annexed land to pre-war borders, shifting Germany's eastern border west to reduce its size, and the expulsion of German populations living outside outside this new border in Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Hungary. That is something that has n- had no repercussions at all. I can't imagine. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. And finally, the transformation of Germany's pre-war heavy industry economy, which had been extremely important for the Nazi military build-up during World War II, into a combination of agriculture and light domestic industry. So with Germany divided and a new post-war dawn, post-war dawn cresting on the horizon, a new nation was born, and with it beginning the process of denazification. Now, it's well known that the Nazis loved paperwork. 
They went to painstaking lengths to codify and track every possible detail they could, many of which would lead to the subsequent trials of Nazi war criminals, but also the thing they loved as well was tracking Nazi party membership. It was like the thing they loved the most was like rigid, violent bureaucracy. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's how um you know uh, a lot of people on the far right tend to be a uh, stem people who loves details Nazis. Oh, God. I mean, and a lot of the Nazis uh, were doctors. Um, yeah. they're incredibly well educated people who love themselves some in depth and intricate filing systems. <laughs> Once again, Joe, you are preceding something I'm about to talk about. God damn it. Um, so now almost the entire records of the Nazi party membership were saved by a single man, which led to the almost complete membership dossier of the Nazi party members being handed over to the Allies. The list generally broke down into who were active and who were passive members of the Nazi party, because during World War II, obviously there was conscription, there was forced membership for some people into the Nazi party. A lot of people... This is something that we'll talk about with the legacy of fascism later in this episode where yeah, we've talked about this before, like, um, you know, during our episode on the White Rose movement, like they refused to go to university because in order to go to university, you had to be a member of the Nazi party, like something as simple as that. So um, each zone was given autonomy when it came to denazification and each had their own version of restorative justice for the crimes of the Nazi regime. The Soviets interned over 120,000 people, according to official records. I'm using air quotes. The British, although particularly zealous during the beginning of the process, kind of gave up after a while and only required people uh, filled out the Froggenbogen. I hope I'm saying that right. Flawless. Which was a questionnaire required for the disclosure of former Nazi party membership. If former Nazi party members were seeking an official or responsible position. The French. I'm going to give you... Do you want to guess what the French did? I'm assuming they were psychotic. No, the French pretty much just fucking gave up. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I mean, I guess the, the inside of every Frenchman, there are two wolves. <laughs> yeah, the French pretty much gave up because many of the French army command were collaborators with the Vichy regime and also found that too many people of operational importance to their zone were former Nazis and therefore instead retained French control of the ability to reverse any functional decision. That That's kind of interesting that they were so, like, well, lazy about it when you saw it, like, when, especially when you see how the French treat, like, German POWs, which, I mean, look, I'm not asking for sympathy for German POWs by any stretch of the imagination. However, using them to, like, demine areas by stomping through them, generally bad. Um, See, th this is something that we've talked about quite a lot on this show, is that after any sort of like large-scale conflict within a country where there has to be a reformation of power, what usually happens is you'll find that quite a lot of the people who are required to run a country in terms of like, you know, just pure administrative systems, a lot of them were just probably members of the previous ruling party. And then you have to have that question of, do you completely get rid of everyone and then have to run the entire country with a much smaller team? Or do you kind of fudge the numbers a little bit and say like, yeah, just uh, sign that in, pe in pencil, not pen, you know, just in case we need to change it. Yeah, and not to mention run the country with a much smaller team who almost certainly are not either A, have any experience in that job because they weren't able to do it before or, you know... uh they're just some random new loyalists to the occupational regime. Cough, debathification, cough. <laughs> so uh, you might have noticed there's one uh, power that I haven't spoken about yet. And now the Amer and that's the Americans who decided to rejig the Froggenbogen and instead replaced it with the Meldebogen, which broke Nazi supporters into five different categories of punishment. So in, you know, ascending order, we have uh, a grade five, which is a person exonerated, so no sanctions. A grade four, which was a follower, uh, possible restrictions on travel, employment, political rights, and some fines. Then you have a grade three, which is lesser offenders, and they would be placed on probation for two to three years with, with a list of restrictions, but no internment. Then you had a grade two, which was an offender, activist, militant, and profiteers, or incriminated person. 
Now, these were subject to immediate arrest and imprisonment for up to 10 years performing reparation or reconstruction work plus a list of other restrictions. And then you have a grade one, which was a major offender. Um, they the ones were subject- are probably supposed to be turned into wind chimes. Yeah, so these were subject to immediate arrest, death, imprisonment, with or without hard labor, plus a list of lesser sanctions. So even within these grades, there's quite a lot of varying degrees. Like some people had like very severe sanctions. Some people were, you know, just fully executed. Um, Some people were just, you know, imprisoned. So this was all well and good, but overwhelmed by the task of a massive judicial load, the American Administrative Design zone instead decided to intern nearly 100,000 former Nazis and classify 1,900,000 as forbidden to work as anything other than manual labors. I hate being uh, overwhelmed with a massive load. (laughs) (laughs) But this whole system was a failure and was almost completely abandoned by 1951. This is not even to touch on Operation Paperclip, where the US government granted amnesty to 785 Nazi rocket scientists and many other German officials and others. The Soviet Union conveniently also did the same thing, although their numbers are a lot more vague and harder to pin down. So essentially, everyone just pick and choose who to punish and, hmm, let's get Werner von Braun, you know, to develop rockets in the US. Of course. It's not surprising. Yeah. By the time denazification was abandoned, many of the high-ranking officials in the German state, civil service, as well as industry, media, etc., etc., were all former active Nazi party members. And the new specter haunting Europe was the ghost of fascism. Thankfully, we're not dealing with that anymore. (laughs) Don't look up Operation Gladio. Um, Don't look up most of the current governments of Europe. (laughs) (laughs) So, um... On May 6th, 1945, Mr. Andreas Bader was born in Munich to parents Annelise and Bernd Philipp Bader. Andreas' father had been taken prison by the Soviets in 1945 and was reported missing, so Andreas grew up surrounded by his mother, grandmother and aunt. Bader was swaddled with affection as a child, which he almost universally bristled against, and from an early age, proved to be difficult and stubborn with teachers often remarking that although he was quite intelligent, he was lazy and volatile, often refusing to take orders from teachers and figures of authority. How this very have, un-German of him. This will have no relevance in the future. <laughs> um, he had a quite generous streak in him and his remark that he would literally give someone the shirt off his back if he saw them cold while simultaneously becoming a very good petty thief at the same time. His anti-authoritarian I'll streak... I'll give you the shirt off of my back that I stole from someone else. <laughs> <laughs> His anti-authoritarian streak came at a very young age, refusing to receive confirmation out of protest against organized religion, would not celebrate his own birthday, and tried to convince his mother to not celebrate Christmas. He got in fights frequently at school, at school and mostly as a physical endpoint of an argument that he refused to concede, and people commented that you either loved him or hate him. So I don't see who could love him. He seems like a Reddit atheist in the fucking 40s. (laughs) Andreas Bader, a, you know, very, very stubborn child who hated authority and would refuse to concede arguments is going to have no relevance in part two. (laughs) And, you know, next uh, the counterpoint to the name, the Bader Meinhof Group, although I argue it should be called the Bader Enseling Group. But anyway, uh, Ulrike Meinhof was born on October 7th, 1935, in Oldenburg, Germany, her father being a doctor of art history, who became the head of the city of Jena's museum where Ulrike, when Ulrike was two years old. Both of her parents died of cancer, her father in 1940 and her mother in 1948. Ulrika and her older sister were then looked after by her mother's former bo- boarder, Renate Ramak. People say boarder. There is a, a lot tenant? of evidence. No, that this is kind of, you know, when historians say, oh, they were really good friends. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Ulrika Meinhof uh, quickly began to learn the socialist views of her new care and 
In contrast to Andreas Bader, Ulrike was very well educated, studying sociology, philosophy and German studies at Marburg. And in 1957, she was studying at a university near Munster. Here she showed that radicalism, uh, showed the radicalism that would lead her on her future path, joining the Socialist Student Union and getting involved in anti-rearmament protests and anti-nuclear protests. She also displayed her skill at writing and her eloquence when she began writing for the student newspaper Concrete or Concrete. Once again, a thing that will be very relevant soon. You're currently you're just explaining like I didn't know anything about these guys. I uh, now the one thing that I, if I was to paint what their childhood looked like and their upbringing looked like, I assume they'd be slightly more fucked up, but but so far everything's on cue like kid of an academic right, being the the normal campus left-wing person wh- who works for the student newspaper like all these things are kind of tracking yeah and like i'll talk a little bit about this after we talk about you know the third person here who is also like deeply important to this series and that is gudrun ensling so Born in 1940 in Barthloma uh, to a Protestant pastor uh, father and the middle of seven children, uh, Gudrun had a generally middle class upbringing and inherited her parents' interest in politics as well as a distinctly Protestant view on the nature of right and wrong. In 1958, she spent a year studying in the Methodist community in Pennsylvania. While she was there, she noted in her diary that she had a dislike for American Christians. I mean, fair enough. (laughs) She had a disdain for their jewels and diamonds and their hypocritical piety. Gudrun also internalized her family's religious and political outlook, combining the Christian belief of fellowship with political action. Both faith and politics not ending at the door, but believing and doing what is right, extending to every aspect of life. So she kind of, she is like very interesting as a comparison to the other two, because like, like Andreas Bader's, upbringing wasn't inherently political it was just you know he came from a working class family where you know he went to school he was argumentative and he just kind of became a little bit of a hellion he yeah, sounds like an abrasive dickhead while the other two seem very normal <laughs> oh hold on to that thought we have four episodes of andreas <laughs> Potter being a fucking dickhead <laughs> outstanding so, um, the weirdest when, part about Insling is when she came back from Pennsylvania, she just wore an Eagles jersey everywhere. <laughs> but like the uh it, it's really interesting like here like reading how she viewed American Christians and like the hypocrisy of, you know, they're almost kind of like this is post war, so like cre- kind of growing extravagant wealth, obviously not on the same levels as there is today, but like the kind of wealth enjoyed by Americans after World War II compared to Germans and the combination of like, because like European Protestantism, particularly German Protestantism, is like very austere as well. Like a lot of people yeah. kind of call it like the kind of cold Christians. Where like American whereas, Christianity is like no matter what denomination you're from, it's all like seems to be based in Calvinism. Yeah, or like it's the 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 doctrinal Christian version of "fuck you, I got mine" because God loves me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. Um, uh, what was the dude who fucking died last week or the other month? Pat, what's his face? Oh, Pat Robertson. Yeah. yeah. Rest in peace, bitch. Yep. Um, when Gudrun uh returned to Germany while studying at Tübingen, uh. There's Nailed so it. many Germans who are going to be so mad at me. Direct um, all of your hatred of the German of our pronunciation, the German language, to Nate. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, it was Nate's choice not to be on this series, so blame him. <laughs> the one of us uh, who speaks German. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so while sitting there, she met Bernward Vesper, the son of poet Will Vesper, a favorite of many Nazis. Uh, Bernward hated his father and despite Gudrun's father's disapproval of his daughter's soon to be fiance the two uh, disillusioned would distance themselves from traditional German family life and disillusioned from German political life would soon become deeply immersed in the German student anti-authoritarian movement the, the hardest so- part of divorcing yourself from those movements is removing the later hosen. <laughs> you got you gotta get loads of like vaseline to like slide it off oh, you gotta slip out of it like a slug it's like people who are like into latex you have to put like talcum powder on the inside so you can actually like get it on 
You see, that that's what, like, uh, of, of all of the various other reasons that I'm not into latex, I feel like me having to cover myself in a thin layer of lubricant to slide into anything. <laughs> Take that statement any way you want. I'm not a fan. So, an important note on Meinhof is that the student politics movement in the post in post-war Germany was inherently radical due to the vast majority of students at the time were born either during the war, directly preceding it, or directly in its aftermath. There was huge ill will during this period towards the state, mainly attributed to the failure of denazification and the lingering influence of fascism in daily life. The CDU, the Christian Democrats, the ruling party of West Germany, had its legacy in the wartime period, with its founding attracting conservatives, anti-communists, and former Nazi collaborators into its highest offices. The CDU was was decried as an apparatchik of Western powers and a buffer to the communist influence of the Eastern Bloc. Likewise, much of the media, both state and independent within Germany at the time, had a strong socially conservative viewpoint, which very much aligned with that of the parties like the CDU. Bild, or Bild Zetong, a daily newspaper from Axel Springer Media, was launched in 1952 and modelled itself on the British tabloid The Daily Mail. Oh, so, God. Uh, yeah. Uh, it published sensational and often inflammatory articles aimed at riling up the blood of the German people. You know, the blood of the German people does not need to be riled up. No, we've, we've experienced that before. <laughs> and its defender said that it was simply an accurate measurement of the disjointed German people. It was extremely anti-communist, and there has been accusations that Springer was able to initially expand during the industrially lean post-war years due to American funding. Axel Springer himself used the Kurt Schumacher line of calling communists red painted Nazis. Oh boy. So you have a government that is filled with former Nazis who is actively hostile to the Eastern Bloc, and you have a news media that calls all communists red painted Nazis. I'm sure this can only go well. Oh, thankfully, we don't go through that anymore. <laughs> God. Right wing reactionary media funded by the US government? I often say that uh, time is a big, flat, dumb circle. Yeah. You, you need to be taking like a pull of your vape while you say that to do the real rust coal thing. <laughs> so, by the early 1960s, Ulrike Meinhof had suddenly sprung to fame due to her article in Concrete comparing the CSU part party leader Franz Strauss to Hitler. Strauss tried unsuccessfully to sue Meinhof but didn't even make it to court uh, but the prospective case immediately made Ulrike Meinhof a household name overnight. That's not she what felt, any student writer needs in their life. Yeah, like you really don't need to be elevating a 20 year old to like national renown for calling the leader of a party a Nazi. Look, I'm I'm just saying these these guys would get along great in like modern posting culture. <laughs> uh, that's to be not, honest, that's not a that's not a compliment or an insult. It just seems to be a fact. Like the one thing I will concede to Andreas Bader is he would have been incredible on Twitter. <laughs> like just like pure schizo brain, ne- like constantly posting through it. One thing that we will talk about in the next episode is Andreas Bader's unique ability to just rant at people for hours at a time. Look, we're talking about college-age leftists who work for student newspapers. The fact that they could go on for hours about shit does not suppress me. (laughs) I was friends with those guys at university because, you know, I am vaguely leftist in a lot of ways. But at the same time, uh, like, it actually reminds me. um, Have you ever seen the movie um, Munich? No. Uh, well, without going into details, because it's not not exactly a great movie, but there is a scene where um, like the, these Mossad assassins are posing as uh, like vague European leftists, and they meet. It's like a batter Meinhof uh, safe house uh, that they're staying in, and there's just an incredibly stoned German woman in the corner, just ranting, like muttering. Uh, about Marxism and there and one and like her boyfriend is like, isn't it great? She could go on for hours. <laughs> oh no, Joe, wait until part two. <laughs> like w- it will feature Andreas Bader going on so much and ranting at a PLO commander about the fact he won't get any treats. Yes, 
<laughs> so, uh, Meinhof fell pregnant in 1962, but soon began to experience severe headaches and vision problems. But due to the pregnancy, she chose to forego the surgery as she would have to choose between her twins or the operation. She had to give birth seven weeks early and eventually had brain surgery where in uh, where instead of a suspected tumour, they found an enormously enlarged blood vessel which could not be removed without hemorrhaging and instead they clamped it shut with a metal clip. Word of note, everything that I have said over the past half an hour will be very relevant for the next three episodes. I can't imagine um, having a blood vessel clamped in your brain is is great for you. Yeah. So, like, everything I have said about Gudrun Esling, Ensling, Ulrika Meinhof, and Andreas Bader will be very important. So, after three months recovering hosp- in hospital, she returned to work, diving even deeper into her political writing than before. By the same time, in 1963, a 20-year-old Andreas Bader would arrive in West Berlin, West Berlin at the time was a che- was cheap to live in due to a plethora of empty buildings after the war, and because of tax concessions, young Bohemians could easily find themselves somewhere to live. So you have I have an a- idea how to lower all of our rents where we currently live, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So West Berlin at this time, there a lot of wealthy families had abandoned Berlin and moved to the moved to West Germany, where they could you know have access to a lot of things that you couldn't get in East Germany, even in West Berlin. So loads of empty houses, lots of people squatting, a lot of people renting out places for like dirt cheap. It was like, well, either I can let it be empty and a lot of students can squat in my apartment or I can charge someone like 200 Deutschmarks a month and they can live in it. Every German listening who currently lives in Berlin or like uh, in the general area is smashing their head against the wall, logging for these moments. <laughs> so by 1964, Meinhof was dedicating her time to either her political writing or raising her newborn daughters, or Bettina and Regine. Uh, at the same time, Concrete had its funding withdrawn by the KDP. This is the uh, Communist Party in East Germany. Over uh, Jurgen H- name alert, Holt Clamps or uh, Holt Camps, uh, writing about the Prague Spring and demanding Holt Camp be dismissed as well as Klaus Roll, Meinhof's husband, be removed from his editor- editorship. So, yeah, we can see the kind of political alignment of the people we're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. You can't criticize the Prague Spring. Who would have thought this is actually the origin story of Kindle Direct Publishing? (laughs) All the KDP's demands were refused, and the 40,000 Deutschmark stipend which funded the periodical was ended. In order to keep the paper going without the financial support of the KDP, Roll began to mingle sex and politics with big-breasted women and political commentary now gracing the front page. I mean, we all knew this was coming, right? (laughs) <laughs> who knew uh, German Marxist Leninists invented page three <laughs> comrades I have this idea to establish a new party headquarters and we'll call it Bergheim I mean, any weird niche political ideology always ends up in a pile of sex yep so how well do you think this tactic went oh a, a paper editor fucking his way through everybody around him no, no, no. The the putting big tits on the front of the paper to in, uh, increase sales. Oh, it worked sales. great. It worked great. Yeah. It was a resounding success with the paper circulation rocketing from 2,000 copies to almost 100,000 copies. I mean, uh, people don't change. Uh, like, there was even a thing that fucking Der Sturmer did. Uh, they They talked about lurid things like, you know, sex and prostitution and like people bought it that who weren't even Nazis because they're like, no, nah, I want to read about fucking <laughs> like yeah, people are simple animals, man. Mm-hmm. So at the same time, Ulrika also began working on television and radio while still writing her column for Concrete. Uh, she quickly became a well-respected journalist outside of her work in Concrete, producing investigative documentaries for the likes of Panorama and was a regular on panel discussion shows talking about political issues. Um, her and Roel both 
bought an old house together and did it up. They began to settle into a provocative but comfortable life. You know, they were agitators but enjoyed all the treats. Uh, they were they were privileged agitators. Those are my favorite kind. Yeah, you know, we everybody loves the upper middle class soldier for the working class. You know, although she enjoyed uh, this new life, she was still drawn to the radicalism of the student movement. In her diary, she wrote, and this is a quote: "My relationship with Klaus, my acceptance by the establishment, my work with the students, three aspects of my life that seem irreconcilable are pulling and tearing at me." At least she felt guilty about it. Yeah, you, lo- you love petty bourgeois guilt. Um, <laughs> our house, the parties, camping, all of that only partly enjoyable. But among other things, it is the basis from which I can be a subversive element. TV appearances, contacts, the attention I get, they're all part of my career as a journalist and a socialist. They get me a hearing beyond concrete by way of radio and television I even find it pleasant, but it doesn't satisfy my need for warmth, solidarity, and belonging to a group. The part I play, the part which gets me entry to that society, corresponds only very partially to my real nature and needs. It involves me in adopting the attitude of a puppet, forcing me to say things smilingly when to me, to all of us, they are deathly serious. So I say them with a grin, as if masked. I mean, if you eliminate what where this eventually leads, and also the 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 weird sex infused political newsletter, like I think this is kind of most people just living. Yeah, like you can really see, and it, it like this episode is like really important, and I, I'm sure some people would be like, "Oh, you're diving like too much into like the personal lives of like Ulrika Meinhof and Bader and stuff," but like this stuff becomes so important because as like a unit of like those three people their personalities and eventually people who will join them is so important because so much of their actions are informed by their own personal personalities and yeah, of course become- i think people who try to understand people from history like what we always do on the show their personalities are incredibly important their personalities is what drive them to do what they do they don't exist in a vacuum yeah, and particularly like Ulrika Meinhof is like her personal feelings both about like the movement and what she will eventually get into and like the outside regular world is something that causes her like so much conflict, which actually like fuels a lot of things that happen. So she, she feels conflicted and probably I have no idea where the story goes other than the obvious vastly overcorrects. Yeah, so <laughs> um, the year is 1963. Joe, what happens in 1963? I actually don't know. That could mean a lot of things. <laughs> uh, the Americans start war- bombing campaigns in rural Vietnam. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that is that is true. <laughs> and by, I shouldn't really be laughing about it, uh, by August 1964, B-52 bombers would regularly conduct bombing raids over cities and by 1965, the actions of the U.S. in North Vietnam would cause wor- widespread condemnation worldwide and spark waves of protest and unrest. In April 1965, two and a half thousand students would march through the streets of West Berlin, 500 of which would detach from the group and the pre-approved route to directly demonstrate in front of the America House, lowering the flag half-mast and someone even throwing five eggs at the building. What the fuck is the American house? It just sounds like a McDonald's. So it's an it's an administrative building in West Berlin at the time. Ah, uh, okay. So burgers are actually not involved somehow here. Well, look, uh, Americans can only conceptualize th- in things in terms of burgers. So it, you're showing your American side. I'm I'm doing my best. Uh, <laughs> like. Um, the German public and more specifically the Springer Press like Bild were outraged. Willy Brandt the mayor of West Berlin even had to f- issue a formal apology for the actions of the protesters. Yeah, because like the Americans are confused. Like if this happens here, we just shoot them. <laughs> so, so indignation turned to protest, protest to resistance, resistance to violence, and from and from the first parallels with the Third Reich were drawn. Ulrika Meinhof said in one of her one of her columns, 
at the moment when solidarity with the Vietnamese become a matter of serious concern, when people want to weaken the American position all over the world as far as possible in the interests of the Vietnamese, then I really see no difference between the police terrorist methods that we have already seen in Berlin that threaten us now and the terrorism of the SA in, 90, in the 1930s. Man, like... Like I, I understand that she is young and radicalized, but you, you also see these comparisons in a, in a lot of things when there's, you know, in generally democratic, generally democratic and generally, generally free countries. So like, oh, they're just like the Nazis. Like the Nazis literally guillotined people who protested against them. Like the White Rose Collective was all executed via guillotine because they were spreading a zine on a college campus. Like, calm down. <laughs> yeah. Um, n- honestly, but I will say to a counterpoint, she's not necessarily like drawing a line from the current German government to the Nazis. I think it's more so she's drawing a comparison of Germany and particularly West Berlin and West Germany being an extension of American imperialism and calling comparing American imperialism at the time to the Nazis. Oh, okay. Fair enough. I mean, quite literally, West Germany and East Germany are all imperial extensions of their overlords. Like, I will give her that much. (laughs) In April of 1967, the American vice president, Hubert Humphreys, was scheduled to visit Berlin. The students planned to have a response upon his arrival, and the students began Commune 1, or Commune with a K-1, a community intended to revolutionize the bourgeois individual. So here we're going to talk about sex. Uh, I knew con- that's where this was going. Look, look. if you're a 20-year-old dude and you're starting a commune, obviously you're going to want to fuck. That's you want to bust one out. You're just describing any commune ever made. It's eventually going to like devolve into a writhing pile of naked human bodies. <laughs> I know it smell uh, wild in there. Oh. Um, in this commune, uh, this is a quote, sexual needs were to develop with less inhibition, isolation is to be eliminated, and the struggle for liberation from the pressures of cap- of the capitalist society were uh, more effectively carried on. We're just political uh, fucking butts. We get it. Uh, Dieter Kunzelmann, uh, the brain behind Commune 1, commune one appealed, you must uproot yourselves, reject your grants, reject security, give up your studies, risk your personality. And I know it sounds like... It sounds cultish. It it does, but also I think what he's doing is they're connecting like the continuity of, you know, the rejection of everything you have to say someone like Rosa Luxemburg, who is like the most classical example of an actual class trader of like literally throwing away every single thing you have in, you know, support of the struggle and, you know, Rosa Luxemburg gave her life for it. Right. The students planned to throw balloons filled with, do you want to have a guess? Uh, piss? Custard. I like mine better. <laughs> <laughs> how, they gonna fill, I, how do you fill a balloon with custard? That's actually, like... What a funnel. It's a, like... But also, my thing is that, like, since custard is a non-Newtonian liquid, so... Um, it's liquid when it's in a non-impact state, but then when it impacts, it's solid. Uh, the dualities of custard. Yeah. Ketchup, also another non-Newtonian liquid. Um, does the custard hurt when it hits you because you're it's exerting force on the custard? So is it going to burst like a water balloon or is it going to hit you like a rock and then explode? That's a good question. There's only one way to find this out. Yeah. They planned to throw these custard-filled balloons. Um, they mixed up some of the balloons in an apartment and decided to test them in a park, throwing them at trees. The sp- Do you want to know what the Springer tabloid build uh, headline this as? Oh, something about terrorism, I'm sure. Yeah. So the Springer tabloid build spun the weaponized dessert into a full bomb threat. <laughs> what if clowns got radicalized and couldn't throw pies anymore? <laughs> <laughs> clowns uh, ISIS clowns um, on the basis of this inflated piece and uh, bogus reporting the paper commented on its inside pages we shall know how to deal with these bombers the majority of the German people feel understanding for the American struggle in Asia 
The what? conspirators. Custard. It's the new WMDs. Custard, custard is uh, getting slapped in the face of the balloon of custard is literally the same as getting napalmed. WMCs, weapons of mass custard. Uh, WMDs, mass uh, weapons of mass deliciousness. Everybody loves a good custard. The conspirators were arrested only briefly since very soon they could see, be no denying that their explosives had consisted of nothing but custard, pudding, and curd cheese. Yeah, they're just trying to, they're just, it's just, you know, the German version of food, not bombs. <laughs> but it was a fire in a, Br- in a Brussels department store that would give the commune their next idea. 300 people died in an accidental fire in the Belgian department store at Le Innovation on the 22nd of May, 1967. Oh man, this shouldn't give anybody ideas. The commune members saw the tragedy as a sort of poetic resemblance to the suffering of the North Vietnamese under the napalm bombs of the Americans and the burning of the department store as a symbolic effigy of bourgeois capital. They wrote... They wrote a series of leaflets and distributed them uh, at the Free University. The first leaflet was headlined, New Kinds of Demonstration tied out for, Tried Out for the First Time in Brussels. The second leaflet bore the title, Why Do You Burn, Consumer? For the first time in any big European city, a burning store full of burning people gives the, that crackling Vietnam feeling of being there and burning too. Uh, Something but, previously... But this was an accident, I assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, something previously unavailable here in Berlin. Sympathetic as we feel towards the pain of the bereaved in Brussels, yet being receptive to new ideas, we cannot help admiring the bold and unconventional character of the Brussels department store fire, despite all the human tragedy involved. So, like, they're calling what, like, was an accidental electrical fire of some kind, like, some kind of political triumph? I'm, I'm so <laughs> confused here. So... They then went even further in their third leaflet. When the when will the department stores in of Berlin f- burn? It went on. Hitherto, the Yankees have been dying for Berlin in Vietnam. We were sorry to see our the poor souls obliged to shed their Coca Cola blood in the Vietnamese jungle. So we started by marching through empty streets with placards, throwing the occasional egg at American at America House, and we would have liked to finish by seeing. Hubert Horatio Humphrey die smothered in pudding. Our Belgian friends have at last found the knack of really involving the population in all the fun of Vietnam to set fire to a department store. 300 complacent citizens end their exciting lives and Brussels becomes Hanoi. None of us need sh- need to shed any more tears for the poor Vietnamese over our morning paper at breakfast. Now you can just go to the clothing department at Ca De Wei, uh, Hugh Herty Woolworths, Bilk or Neckerman, and light a discreet cigarette in the changing room. If there is a fire somewhere in the near future, if the barracks happens to blow up, if a stand happens to collapse in some stadium, then please don't be surprised any more than you are surprised by the bombing of the city centre of Hanoi. Brussels has given us the only answer. Burn, warehouse, burn. Look, as as ridiculous as this entire thing is, that thing is full of bangers. For yeah, like Coca Cola blood, classic. Uh, hoping that the vice president dies in a vat of pudding, amazing. Yeah, honestly, they really popped off with that. Yeah. Do you know what the response to these leaflets were? Were they arrested? Yeah. Uh, seven of the commune members were charged with incitement of criminal acts. I mean, yeah. I, I, look, as as obviously the the freedom of speech is very important, as is the freedom of press, but like. When you're writing about how you should set things on fire and, you know, hypothetically kill hundreds of people because they're championing a supermarket or or department store fire that killed 300 people, like, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. So, this is where uh, things stop being kind of jokey. Um, (laughs) Well, we had one episode. (laughs) So, also... In the summer of 1967, a visit from another foreign dignitary uh, would happen in Berlin, and history would be changed irrevocably, because in early, well, in mid-1967, the Shah of Iran, Reza Pahlavi, would visit the Federal Republic, much to the outcry of the German left. 
Oh, I can't think of anything horrible he was doing at the time. Smash cut to Savak headquarters. Yeah. So, oh, they're going to come up. Oh, um, god damn it. So, Ulrika Meinhof wrote a open letter to Faradiba for concrete. You tell us the summer is very hot in Iran, and like most Persians, I went to the Persian Riviera on the Caspian Sea with my family. Like most Persians, you say? Aren't you exaggerating? Most Persians are peasants with an annual income of less than $100. Most Persian women see every other child, 50 out of 100, die of starvation, poverty, and disease. And do most of those children who work 14 hours a day making rugs go to the Persian Riviera on the Caspian Sea in summer too? We do not want to insult you, but nor do we want to see the German public insulted by articles such as yours in Neue Review. So... This is kind of the tone at the time. The preparations for the visit were reminiscent of the police state of the not-so-distant past. Large groups of students protested the Shah's arrival on the 2nd of June. Immediately upon his arrival at Schoenberg City Hall in that afternoon, protesters began to chant, throw bags of paint, and push past security barriers. The Iranian secret police immediately started beating the shit out of people. Yeah, that's, that's what they're used to while the German police just looked on, unmoved, and passively watching while a foreign security force attacked German civilians. It kind of reminds me, like, it was a couple of years ago, um, the Turkish security service, MIT, was doing that in D.C. Uh, <laughs> like, they just started beating the ever-living shit out of protesters, and nobody did anything to stop them. That evening, when the Shah and his wife attended an opera, uh, attended the opera, protesters threw bags of flour at him and then subsequently retreated to later regroup once the performance had included. Did they hit him? Uh, uh, they landed like close to the red carpet. I don't I don't think they actually hit him. Ah, oh, damn, um, boy should have stuck to the fucking custard. Yeah, should have. You got, you got more splash damage with the custard. It's hard, harder to get out of the clothes. Probably flies better, much more solid. Yeah. You know. Um. So... Upon their retreat, suddenly a number of ambulances drove up, 14 in all. The police who had stationed themselves in the front, in a line in front of the demonstrators, took out truncheons. Some onlookers tried to get away from the barriers but were driven back. Then the police attacked, wielding their truncheons without giving the usual warning first. Many demonstrators collapsed, they were beaten, covered in blood. Uh, a young housewife fell full length in the road under the blows and was carried out by the by the policeman and found her picture in the newspaper the next day with the caption to the effect that the brave police officers had saved her from a shower of stones flung by inhuman demonstrators. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So within a few minutes, the ambulances were full. Demonstrators ran away in a panic if the police would let them. In the darkness, the students could hardly make out which were the ununiformed police, which were plainclothes men, and which were agents of the Shah. One of the plainclothes men, Detective Sergeant Carl Heinz Kuras, aged 39, from Department 1 of the Political Police. He and his colleagues formed a snatch squad. Around 10.30pm, these officers were near uh, Street 66 and 67, Krummenstrasse. There was a line of policemen on one side and facing them, uh, a last band of demonstrators shouting murderers and the demonstrators threw stones at them. One of the officers thought he spotted the ringleader, a man with a moustache and a red shirt and bare sandaled feet. The officer made for him. Carl Heinz Kuras followed his colleague, seized the suspect and flung him to the ground. Uniformed men came to their aid. Demonstrators arrived to surround the policeman and there was a hand-to-hand fighting. The student who had been th- thrown to the ground tore himself free and tried to get away. The police gave chase, reached him and showered him with blows. Carl Heinz Kuras was among those at the spot holding his 7.65 millimeter pistol with the safety catch off the muzzle was less than a half a meter away from the demonstrator's head or that was how it looked to eyewitnesses suddenly a shot rang out the bullet hit the man above the right ear entered his brain and smashed his skull one of the police officers heard the shot turned and saw Karas holding his gun are you crazy shooting around here he shouted and Corus just said, it just went off. The dead man was Benno Osenberg, 26 years old, studying Romance languages and literature. 
a pacifist and an active member of the Protestant student community. It was his first time he ever attended a demonstration. Christ. Well, unfortunately, cops seem to have never changed. Yeah, and also, uh, Heinz Kuras uh, was likely a member uh, or an agent of the Stasi. What? Yep. Fuck it. How the fuck does that come out of nowhere? Uh, it It's like, there's been loads of inquiries since into the shooting, and like, papers that have been like released some of them have been redacted in the like 2010s suggest that he was actually like a east german agent i mean but would he i can think of nothing more agitate like that would be you know a source of agitation than a uniformed police officer of west germany murdering a college student uh during a you know vaguely left-wing demonstration However, I mean, this is where you tell me that that Kuras gets away with it. But like, I would say like why uh, this would be like, you know, a kamikaze agitation run executing someone in the middle of the street. Like the cop is almost certainly going to be brought to justice, right? Um, We'll talk about that in part four. God damn it. Um, Fuck. After the events of June 2nd, that it propelled the student movement into further solidarity and contemplation of what was to be done to resist state violence and the oppression that had been on display that day. Students who had who had already started reading and protest groups had begun to see simply civil unrest as insufficient forms of action and deemed more decisive and immediate acts of disruption. Uh, of course. Yep. I on mean, the... violence begets violence. Yeah. Uh, tale as old as time. On the 22nd of March, 1968, uh, Rainer Langhans and Fritz Tufel of Commune 1 were found not guilty of incitement of arson. The leaflets that they had distributed were deemed to be satire, but had already taken hold in the imagination of Berlin students. They got away with it, like, in Minecraft defense? Pretty much. (laughs) Um, There's a whole... incredible. So... I, I will, as we are coming to close this episode, I will say to people, there is a lot of, like, court cases and legal drama involved in this story. I really only, apart from the obvious one, I really only cover it in brief because I feel like it. you can get bogged down in it way too much. Law and order, um, special mind, ma- batter Meinhof division. Yeah. Dun dun. <laughs> um... Thorwald Prohl, a Berlin student and the son of an architect, wrote a poem in his diary in reaction to the case. When will the Brandenburg gates burn? When will the Berlin stores burn? When will Hamburg warehouses burn? When will the writer of Bamberg fall? Uh, When will the sparrows of Ulm twitter from their last holes? When will the October fairgrounds of Munich turn red? I mean, Roll. The, the, the answer to that is like, you mean again? Yeah. <laughs> so by this time, Prohl was friends with Gudrun Ensling and Andreas Bader. And uh, one week after the arsonist's acquittal, they visited Commune 1 to announce that soon they would be waging their own war on the bourgeoisie. And they solicited help from other Commune members, but nobody wanted to join. So the guys, three of them- guys, we're going to go do terrorism. <laughs> would you like to join us in our terrorism like i would immediately yeah. like this guy's a fucking agent like <laughs> so the the three of them headed to munich to visit Bader's friend horse sonlein together they rented a volkswagen and drove to frankfurt making a stop along the way to visit gudrun's family in bad Cannstatt. the car what 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 do you think was in the car bombs i'm gonna go with bombs yeah Uh, The car was loaded with improvised incendiary explosives made out of plastic bottles, petrol, alarm clocks, torch batteries, and detonators, all held together with plastic wrap and sellotape. All right. You know, you you have to you have to kind of admire their 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 stick to itness because this is before you could just look up on the Internet how to build a bomb. Yeah. So on Tuesday, the 2nd of April, 1968, at about 530 a.m., they reached Frankfurt. They were tired and set out to find a place to stay. That afternoon, they strolled through the city centre, taking in, you know, the sights, you know, the kind of lovely architecture and scoping out shopping centres on the main street called The Zeal. Andreas Bader and Gudrun Ensling went into 
the Kaufhaus Schneider store rode up to the furnishing department on the third floor on the escalator and tried out, you know, a couple of beds, they, you know, sat on them, lied on them, jumped on them, I don't know, uh, wandered briefly around the other floors and left the store again. Slightly before closing time, at around 6.30pm, they came back. The shop at this time was almost empty. The escalators had already stopped running and two late customers rushed hand in hand up the stairs. Their worn student style clothing attracted attention. Some of the sales assistants watched in surprise as they passed. You know, they didn't seem like the type to be shopping in this store. Man, these guys look like shit. (laughs) Um, The couple had a hold all with them. When they felt they were unobserved, they took an incendiary bomb out and left it on a shelving unit on the first floor in the ladies clothing department. The second device was planted in the furnishing department in a reproduction old German cupboard. The time fuses were set for midnight. Now at least they set them for a time where nobody should be there. I'm looking for, I'm, I'm looking for small like brights of, of, of positivity here. Yeah. So just before the door the store closed, the couple disappeared out into the street again. A few minutes after the fire in the Kaufhof Schneider began shortly before midnight, the Kaufhof store too was burning. A member of the store staff was on his way to a group of decorators working the night shift on the fourth floor when he heard an explosion behind him. Turning around he saw a wall of flames reaching the ceiling five or seven meters away. The smoke was drifting towards him he coughed his eye stream and he ran uh, from the burning bedding department. Meanwhile the fire had broken out in the toys department too. The sprinkler system was automatically switched on and the firemen soon arrived. Nobody was hurt and the insurance company bore the cost of 2,800 and two three hundred and thirty nine Deutschmarks in the Kaufhaus Schneider, and three hundred and ninety thousand eight hundred and sixty five in the Kaufhof. Shortly before ten a.m., the Frankfurt police re- received a definitive tip off, leading them to the arsonists. A few minutes later, Bader, Ensling, and the other two were arrested. They and the car was searched. The police officers found a screw in Gudrun Essling's handbag which was a duplicate of a screw on one of the incendiary bombs in the car they found parts of clocks a hot bulb section of a battery powered detonator bits of sticky tape that were wrapped around the bombs and other material suitable for the construction of the explosive device guys you want to come search my car i left all of the evidence in here for you all four of them true to their word in commune one had started their own war on the bourgeois state and western imperialism and that morning as the four of them sat in the back of a police van this will begin the journey that would lead to the eventual end of the Bader meinhof group aka the red army faction let's see you all in part two man like these guys kind of suck at being criminals (laughs) they get a lot better at it trust me oh well yeah that does tend to happen when you get away with it i suppose but like, I mean, I don't know what I expected from, again, I don't know anything about the Red Army faction, and I would say I would expect these missteps of a bunch of kids radicalizing themselves. I mean, yeah. and, and, when, and when you're on a commune, like, I know I, I kind of sort of called it a cult because it kind of sounds like one. Um, like, they are, you know, in a self-radicalization, mm-hmm. uh, like, Ouroboros you know, they, yeah, they're, like, they're separate uh, from their families. They're separate from any friends that aren't part of the commune, I would assume. And mm-hmm. as one of them gets more radicalized, they radicalize the other ones. You know, it, it is effectively a cult. Yeah, like at, at this stage, Andreas Bader is like a pretty seasoned, like petty criminal, like he like pickpocketing, thieving, motorbike theft, car theft. Like he's he's already like pretty good at all of these things um even only at you know he's in his early 20s but you know this really this moment really solidifies okay they are willing to go further than anyone else before they're willing to you know put their money where their mouth is and that's what we're going to talk about in part two and three. Oh boy i am going to assume that this does not get worse i'm i'm going to be proven wrong <laughs> yes um and yeah that's the end of part one awesome tom thank you uh it's always nice to occasionally take the back seat 
and um, be the one being surprised and angered by whatever topic we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like this, like the thing, like I have spent so long working on this series, and it's kind of at points you will see a lot of sense in some of the stuff they're doing but it is a lot of it is down to what i will call in part two the andreas Bader mind magic i mean that is not uncommon i mean most terror groups have like legitimate grievances at the base of everything before things quickly fly off the rails and you know uh, some people might get mad we're using the term terrorism even but like i mean definition wise they are absolutely terrorists um however like no matter how legitimate the grievances start as there's always a like a branching off point where someone just takes them into an absolutely wild direction yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent well uh as we are drawing this episode to the close uh if you are new to the show my name is tom i am one of the co-hosts of the show joe is usually the host and um, go back and listen to the back catalog if you want to hear more of me, obviously listen to more of this show and also listen to my show, Beneath the Skin. It's uh, about the history of everything told through the history of tattooing. Um, me and my co talk about all wonderful history connected to tattooing. And I'm going to stop talking now because my throat is really sore. And uh, I'm Joe. This is the only show that I host most of the time. And if you like what we do here, consider supporting us on Patreon. You make everything we do here possible. You get bonus episodes, Discord access, uh, episodes before everybody else. And leave us a review on where it is to listen to podcasts. And if you enjoy reading, consider checking out my books, both about the war in Afghanistan and science fiction. Uh, and uh, Tom, until next, until next time, uh, the, the, something to do with Coca-Cola blood. I love that so much. 